Good morning. Thank you for joining Mayor Brown's Global Financial Markets Teleconference Series. Today's call is entitled CFPB Update, Summertime Development. My name is Ori Lev, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office and a member of our financial services regulatory enforcement practice in our consumer financial services group. I represent financial institutions and other companies in government enforcement matters, internal investigations and litigation, and provide regulatory advice and counsel in federal consumer financial and economic sanctions law. First, a couple of housekeeping items. As regular listeners will know, this call is being recorded. We'll be emailing an audio link to all participants should you wish to listen to the teleconference again or forward it to your colleagues. In addition, the recording will be available as a podcast on your preferred podcast platform. Since we will not have a Q&A session, please send your questions regarding today's topic by email to gfm at mayorbrown.com, and we will respond promptly. This is the same email address on your invitation email. Joining me today are Mayor Brown partner Stephanie Robinson and Associate Krista Beaker. Stephanie Robinson is also a partner in our Washington, D.C. office and a member of our Consumer Financial Services Group. She focuses her practice on a range of matters related to mortgage banking and consumer finance in both the primary and secondary markets, representing banks, mortgage lenders and servicers, and consumer finance companies in enforcement proceedings before U.S. federal and state agencies. Krista Beaker is an associate in our Washington, D.C. office and also a member of our Consumer Financial Services Group. Krista defends companies in connection with government investigations and enforcement actions related to mortgage and consumer credit industry. She also counsels clients in compliance with state and federal consumer finance laws. With that brief introduction, we will now begin today's discussion. And Krista, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Lori. Over the last several months, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has made clear that it's paying close attention to mortgage servicers' response to borrowers impacted by the pandemic. Earlier this summer, the CAPB finalized amendments to Regulation X that are designed to ensure that delinquent borrowers have a meaningful opportunity to be evaluated for loss mitigation options before servicers initiate foreclosure. These amendments became effective last week on August 31st. The CAPB expects many borrowers to exit CARES Act or similar forbearances this fall as they reach their maximum period of forbearance. And since the foreclosure moratoriums for FHFA, FHA, VA, and USDA loans expired on July 31st, the borrowers exiting forbearances may be at a heightened risk of foreclosure. Regulation X generally prohibits servicers from initiating foreclosure until a borrower is more than 120 days delinquent. But while forbearance plans pause payments, they often do not pause the borrower's delinquency. And since borrowers may be in a forbearance for a year or more, they may be well over 120 days delinquent by the time they exit forbearance. This means that without any changes to Regulation X, a servicer may have been able to refer a loan to foreclosure almost immediately after a borrower exits forbearance, unless the borrower has an outstanding complete loss mitigation application. The revisions to Regulation X aim to assist borrowers impacted by the pandemic by, one, restricting many foreclosure initiations through the end of the year, two, requiring servicers to provide certain loss mitigation information to delinquent borrowers and borrowers in forbearance plans, and three, by giving servicers additional flexibility to offer loan modifications to borrowers. I'll briefly discuss each of these provisions. So first, the rules restrict foreclosure initiations until January 2022. If the borrower became delinquent on or after March 1st, 2020, and the statute of limitations applicable to the foreclosure action expires on or after January 1st, 2022, A servicer generally may not file for foreclosure based on a borrower's delinquency unless one of three safeguards are met. So first, the first safeguard is met if a borrower submitted a complete loss mitigation application and is not eligible for loss mitigation, or the borrower is eligible but rejects all loss mitigation, or the borrower accepted a loss mitigation but then failed to perform on that option. Also, the borrower must have remained delinquent at all times since submitting the complete application. The second safeguard is met if the property securing the mortgage is abandoned. And the final safeguard is met if a servicer did not receive any communications from the borrower for at least 90 days before the servicer initiates foreclosure, and the servicer has made certain outreach attempts to the borrower that are detailed in the rule. Because the rules became effective on August 31st, 2021, these restrictions are not applicable to foreclosures initiated before August 31st. But the Bureau has emphasized that the prohibitions against UDAPs, against unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts and practices, still apply 
to borrowers who became eligible for foreclosure before August 31st and who become eligible after the temporary protections expire. And the Bureau is that it fully intends to enforce those prohibitions. The CPB doesn't want servicers rushing borrowers into foreclosure. Next, the rules require servicers to provide certain information to borrowers in forbearance plans that are expiring soon and to delinquent borrowers who are not in forbearance plans. These provisions are designed to ensure that borrowers have timely and accurate information about their loss mitigation options. The amendments require that during regular early intervention calls that servicers are already making to delinquent borrowers, that they must provide borrowers with information about what loss mitigation options are available to them and how they can apply for those options, among other things. Regulation X already requires servicers to have personnel that are able to answer borrower questions on these topics when a borrower calls the servicer. So most servicers currently work to be in a position to provide borrowers with this information. But the landscape of loss mitigation options has been changing so quickly with investors and agencies developing new options to assist borrowers exiting forbearances or just to help borrowers impacted by COVID generally. So providing this accurate and up-to-date information to personnel on these topics in a format then they can quickly digest and then communicate to borrowers accurately during these early intervention calls is challenging. The amendments also require services, servicers to reach out to borrowers who are in short-term forbearance plans that are offered based on the evaluation of an incomplete loss mitigation application, such as a CARES Act forbearance that's based only on a borrower's request for assistance. The servicers are required to reach out to them no later than 30 days before their forbearance expires to see if they would like to submit a complete loss mitigation application and be evaluated for other options that may be able to help them once their forbearance ends. Finally, the amendments give servicers greater flexibility to offer loan modifications to borrowers. The so Regulation X doesn't require servicers to offer borrowers any particular loss mitigation option or even to offer any loss mitigation at all. Instead, Regulation X generally requires that if a borrower submits a complete loss mitigation application that the servicer evaluate the borrower for all loss mitigation options offered by the, the owner or investor of the loan. The rule further prohibits servicers from evading this requirement by offering loss mitigation based on an incomplete application. This is known as the anti-evasion requirement. And the goal is to ensure that the loss mitigation process is streamlined and efficient and that the borrower can be evaluated for everything all at the same time. But completing a loss mitigation application can be time consuming and requiring a completed application trades off with the ability of servicers to be nimble and get help to borrowers quickly. So there are a few exceptions to the anti-evasion requirements and I'll just mention a couple of them. So there's an exception for short-term forbearance plans that allow servicers to offer CARES Act forbearances to borrowers based only on a borrower's request without submitting a complete application. And in June 2020, the CAPB released an interim final rule that allows servicers to offer certain deferral programs to borrowers impacted by the pandemic based on an incomplete application. And the amendments that went into effect last week allow servicers to offer certain loan modifications to borrowers impacted by the pandemic based on an incomplete application. To be eligible for the new exception, the loan modification must meet certain criteria. First, it must be made available to borrowers experiencing a COVID-19 related hardship. Second, it must extend the term of the loan by no more than 480 months. Third, it must not cause the borrower's required monthly principal and interest payments to increase beyond the amount required prior to the modification. Next, the amount that the borrower may delay paying until the loan is refinanced, the mortgage property is sold, the loan modification matures, or for FHA loans, the mortgage insurance terminates. So these amounts that are moved to the end of the loan, those amounts must not accrue interest. Also, it must be designed to end the borrower's delinquency. And finally, the servicer must not charge any fees in connection with the modification, and it must waive all existing fees that were incurred on or after March 1st, 2020. So as long as the modification meets these requirements, investors and agencies have the flexibility to add other features. For example, a modification that amortizes past amounts due over the remaining term or over a new modified term and charges interest on those amounts, those could qualify for the exception. It's only the amounts moved to the end of the loan that you can't charge interest on. Not all loan modification options offered by investors or agencies meet the requirements detailed in the new rule. 
And while servicers are generally able to offer loan modifications to borrowers with whatever features they choose, if the loan modification does not meet the requirements of the new rule, servicers could only offer it if the offer is based on the review of a complete application or if the offer is not based on any information provided by the borrower at all. So like if they offer the modification to all borrowers who are 90 days delinquent or something like that. In addition to the revisions to Regulation X, last month the CAPB released a report on mortgage servicing. The report summarizes data on servicing activities during the pandemic provided by 16 unidentified large servicers, and it covers the period from December 2020 through April 2021. The report doesn't allege any violations of law, but it does shed light on areas on which the CFPB is focused and which might become enforcement priorities. I'll discuss a few of those areas. So first, the report included call data, including the average time to answer calls, and it stated that the average amount of time borrowers waited on the phone before speaking with a representative was 2.7 minutes, but some servicers took 19 or more minutes to answer the calls. And the Bureau didn't tell us how quickly servicers should answer calls, but it did state that borrowers may be at risk of not receiving timely assistance from the servicers with the highest wait times. Next, the report discussed the information servicers collect from borrowers about their language preferences. So nearly half of the servicers the CFPB surveyed stated that they did not collect or maintain information about a borrower's English proficiency status. The CFPB pointed out that if servicers do not collect this data, they may not know which consumers need language assistance. Finally, the report included data on delinquency rates. Although delinquency rates varied significantly among servicers, three servicers showed materially higher delinquency rates on exits from forbearances in excess of 50%. And some servicers showed higher than average rates of delinquent borrowers who never got a forbearance. The CFPB explained that higher numbers and rates in the delinquency metrics may indicate an elevated risk of harm to borrowers at those servicers. So the report highlights that the CFPB is paying close attention to mortgage servicers as forbearances end and foreclosure restrictions expire, and that the CFPB expects servicers to work with borrowers to help them avoid foreclosure. And now I'll turn it back over to Ori. Thanks, Krista. In addition to the steps the CFPB has taken with respect to possible foreclosure, it's also sought to insert itself into the residential rental market. To understand the import of these actions, a brief primer on CFPB jurisdiction is important. As a general matter, the agency has authority with respect to consumer financial products or services as defined in the Dodd-Frank Act. For example, the scope of the CFPB's UDAP authority is limited to transactions involving consumer financial products or services. In addition, the CFPB is authorized to enforce 18 separate consumer financial laws, whether or not those laws relate to a consumer financial product or service. Because unlike a mortgage, a residential lease is not a consumer financial product or service, the issue of tenant rights does not fall within the CFPB's core jurisdiction. Moreover, the CFPB had no separate authority to enforce the now expired CDC eviction moratorium. Nevertheless, the Bureau took two significant steps with respect to the residential rental market in addition to its provision of general consumer education information. First, in April, the CFPB issued an interim final rule under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, or the FDCPA. The rule provided, among other things, that third parties acting on behalf of landlords must disclose to tenants to whom the CDC order, quote, might reasonably apply, that the tenant may be eligible for protection under the CDC order before filing an eviction action for non-payment of rent. The Bureau rested its legal authority on the notion that unpaid rent would typically fall within the FDCPA's definition of debt, that attorneys who engage in eviction proceedings on behalf of landlords may be debt collectors under the Act, and that many tenants were unaware of their rights under the CDC order. Second, in July, the Bureau issued an enforcement compliance bulletin to, in the, in the CFPB's words, quote, remind landlords, consumer reporting agencies, and others of their critical obligations to accurately report rental and eviction information, end quote. The bulletin notes the CFPB's authority to ensure compliance with the Fair Credit Reporting Act, or FCRA, and identifies several specific issues that the CFPB will, quote, pay particular attention to, presumably in its supervisory exams and enforcement investigations. Interestingly, the Dodd-Frank Act expressly excludes tenant screening reports from the definition of a consumer financial product or service, but it doesn't limit the CFPB's authority to enforce the FCRA with respect to such reports. 
both the debt collection rule and the credit reporting enforcement bulletin are examples of creative lawyering, with the agency searching for whatever tools it has available to address an issue not at the core of its mandate, but very relevant to its mission. We expect the CFPB to continue to engage in such creative out-of-the-box thinking to identify as ways in which it can insert itself into issues of importance to consumers, even if they are not traditional consumer financial product or services. Transitioning away from the housing market, there were several interesting developments in pending CFPB litigation over the past several months. One involved CFPB rulemaking and two involved enforcement actions. The first development relates to the challenge to the CFPB's payday rulemaking. That lawsuit, brought by two industry groups, sought to invalidate what's left of the CFPB's payday rule, the provisions that prohibit lenders of certain payday loans from making more than two attempts to withdraw pre-authorized payments from a consumer's account if the two consecutive attempts had failed due to a lack of sufficient funds. These provisions, like the since-revoked underwriting provisions of the rule, were stayed by the court while the litigation dragged on. Last week, the Federal District Court in Texas ruled in favor of the CFPB and the pending challenges and upheld the payment provisions. In its ruling, the court rejected arguments that the CFPB's structure at the time was, the rule was issued in 2017 rendered the rule void, found that then CFPB Director Kraninger's ratification of the rule in 2020 remedied any constitutional problem, and rejected arguments that the payment provisions were arbitrary and capricious or otherwise improper under the Administrative Procedure Act. Among other things, the court upheld the CFPB's finding that the proscribed conduct, that is, making more than two withdrawal attempts when two successive attempts had failed due to insufficient funds, the court upheld the CFPB's finding that that conduct was both unfair and abusive. The court ruled that the provisions would go into effect in 286 days uh, from its ruling on June 13, 2022. That's the amount of time that was left in the rule's original compliance period when the court first stayed compliance with the rule. The CFPB is facing a separate lawsuit from consumer advocates challenging its repeal of the underwriting provisions of the original payday rule. The CFPB has moved to dismiss that case on standing grounds, and the motion has been fully briefed since May. On the enforcement side, the Seventh Circuit issued one of the first appellate decisions addressing the scope of permissible remedies in a CFPB enforcement action. First, the court ruled that the Bureau's authority to obtain disgorgement, restitution, or other equitable monetary remedies only extends to a party's net profits as opposed to its net revenues, meaning that in calculating such remedies, the CFPB would need to deduct a party's legitimate business expenses. Second, with respect to the calculation of civil money penalties, the court reversed the district court's finding that certain defendants in the case had acted recklessly. The court held that the recklessness determination turns not on whether the conduct was reckless, but whether the party acted recklessly with respect to the legality of the conduct. Noting that the legal question at issue in the case, quote, was a legitimate one, end quote, that is, the conduct was not obviously illegal, the court held that the defendants were not aware of, quote, an unjustifiably high or obvious risk of violating the law, end quote. Therefore, they had not committed a reckless violation. This is at least the second judicial opinion, though the first appellate opinion, to make the point that the CFPB cannot collect higher penalties based on a recklessness standard where the legal issue is novel and open to interpretation. These decisions will likely provide some defense to parties subject to novel legal claims by the Bureau. Finally, the Seventh Circuit also clarified that where penalties are calculated on a daily basis, only days on which actual violations occurred can be counted toward the penalty calculation, as opposed to counting every day during the period in which a particular policy or practice was in effect, even if no actual violations occurred on certain dates. Each of the three aspects of this ruling um, establishes important guideposts for what sort of remedies the CFPB can obtain in enforcement actions. The CFPB has until next month to decide whether to seek rehearing on Bank from the entire Seventh Circuit. Lastly, on the enforcement side, the CFPB has teed up for decision a novel UDAP claim it brought a bank against a bank accused of opening unauthorized accounts as a result of its sales practices. When the CFPB filed a complaint asserting a number of UDAP claims relating to the alleged unauthorized account openings, the bank noted that it had already self-identified and remediated over 1,000 suspicious accounts. 
After the CFPB filed suit, the bank hired a third party to examine additional suspicious accounts. That review resulted in remediation of an additional 800 accounts. Earlier this summer, the CFPB filed an amended complaint in the case, adding various claims. One of those claims was that the bank's failure to previously and timely identify these additional 800 suspicious accounts and remediate them itself constituted abusive conduct. And just a few weeks ago, the CFPB moved for judgment on the pleadings on this single abusiveness claim. This novel issue, whether a failure to remediate past conduct where remediation is not otherwise required by law can be considered abusive, is now teed up for a judicial decision in the coming month. Depending on what the court decides and how it rules, the ruling could have broad implications for other parties that are subject to the CFPB's jurisdiction. And with that, I will turn it over to Stephanie. Okay, thanks, Ori. That was really interesting. Um, so I want to talk just about uh, one topic today, the, the biggest news on the rulemaking front, which is that the Bureau has finally released its long-awaited small business data collection proposal. So um, it's been 10 years of fits and starts on this. And as our listeners who uh, regularly tune in will know that the, the Bureau was pressed um, through a lawsuit that was filed against it for dragging its heels on this rulemaking to actually commit to a timeline for publishing this notice of proposed rulemaking, which it finally issued on September 1st. And this all stemmed from a court settlement um, last year. Uh, part of that settlement was that the CFPB had to take certain steps to initiate a Section 1071 small business uh, data collection rulemaking. One of the steps uh, was to convene a small business advocacy review panel by October 15th of last year um, to review the proposals that the Bureau was considering for this rulemaking. And that panel met, they provided some feedback in a report that was issued last December, and then the Bureau agreed as part of the settlement to issue this proposed rule that came out last week. Um, so Section 1071 is the provision of the Dodd-Frank Act uh, from 11 years ago that mandated that the CFPB collect data about small business lending. And the purpose of this is to facilitate fair lending enforcement. Uh, the rule that the, the proposed rule that the CFPB put out last week is over 900 pages long, and it goes through in, in pretty great detail the stakeholder feedback that the Bureau received on all the aspects of its proposals that it had been considering over the, the course of the past year or so. So this rule is going to have pretty significant impacts on financial institutions that take applications from small businesses. Um, it's going to, for, for credit that is, it's going to require collection and annual reporting of certain information about those credit applications. And the financial institutions covered by the rule would include anybody that originated at least 25 credit transactions to small businesses in each of the two preceding calendar years. So it's a, a volume-based um, threshold. The Bureau's not proposing to offer any exemptions based on asset size, which I think came as a disappointment to institutions that were hoping to be exempted because of their uh, small size. Um, another of the key decisions the Bureau made here was deciding to limit the scope of the required information collection to small business applicants. Now, you know, we've been referring to this as the small business rule for some time now as, as, as shorthand. Um, but the, the statute requiring this rule actually reads a little bit more broadly than this. So the Dodd-Frank Act had amended the Equal Credit Opportunity Act to require a financial financial institution to inquire whether a business applicant is a women-owned, minority-owned, or small business. So under the plain language of the statute, the obligation would include any women-owned or minority-owned business applicant, even if it's a very large business. Um, we're not really surprised with what the Bureau decided to do here. The, the proposed rule is not going to require financial institutions to collect and report data regarding applications for women-owned and minority-owned businesses that are not small. Um, and its rationale, which I think they've, they've said a few times now in, in, in the course of putting out their proposals, 
is that most existing businesses are small businesses, so that it's likely that nearly all women-owned and minority-owned businesses are already going to be captured just by virtue of covering small businesses. Um, it's something that the, the, the re Small Business Review Panel had actually recommended that the Bureau continue to explore, but ultimately um, in this proposed rule, the Bureau has decided that limiting the scope to small businesses would be consistent with the underlying intent of the statute. So what are small businesses? Um, the ECOA defines small business to have the same meaning as small business concern under the Small Business Act. And that act provides a general definition of small business concern. It authorizes the SBA to establish five standards for use by all agencies, and also permits an agency to seek approval for a size standard specific to an agency's program. So the Bureau has decided here that it is going to seek approval from the Small Business Administration to, um, to make its definition of small business for purposes of this rule uh, one where the business had $5 million or less in gross annual revenue for its preceding fiscal year, I'm trying to simplify it with this, um, this, this strict cutoff uh, based on revenue. And what are the types of credit products covered? Well, this is gonna cover term loans, lines of credit, credit cards, merchant cash advances, um, a lot of things that you would think of as business credit. It's not gonna include anything that's consumer designated credit. It's also expressly um, not proposing to include leases, factoring, trade credit, or public utilities, securities, or incidental credit, but the Bureau is seeking uh, feedback on that, um, those exclusions. So applications for credit products would have to be reported even if the application was incomplete or was withdrawn. And the reason for that, I mean, that's consistent um, with, uh, with, with, with mortgage um, application disclosure obligations. Um, but, it, but stakeholders thought that that would highlight any potential issues of discouragement or level of assistance disparities or any discriminatory treatment that might have resulted in an applicant uh, withdrawing their application or failing to complete their application. So, uh, so the term application and the information that's gonna be collected is, is relatively broad. Um, what information about the application has to be reported? There's, there's certain data points that are mandated by statute. And then there's others that are within the Bureau's discretion to adopt. So one, for example, is that despite some concerns that were expressed by industry stakeholders, the Bureau has decided to propose requiring the reporting of pricing data. So that would include you know, the interest rate, fees, penalties associated with the credit product uh, being offered. And this was, there was a little bit of controversy around this. The Sabrifa panelists were divided about including pricing data. Some panelists suggested there'd be really no point in collecting any data if the Bureau didn't also require pricing data to put it into perspective. Um, and then others argued that making pricing data public could result in misinterpretations that could result in some un unjustified fair lending concerns. Uh, but ultimately, the Bureau is, is saying in this proposal that it believes that the pricing data and the other discretionary data points that it's proposing are going to serve the purposes of 1071 and, and make the data more useful. Uh, some of the other information that's required is the applicant's length of time in business, um, the number of workers, the number of principal owners. There's a whole chart um, of the proposed data points that is available on the CFPB's website. Um, in general, for information that's self-reported by the applicant, the financial institution isn't going to be required to verify that information. Of course, if it does verify the information, it must report the, the verified information. Um, you know, among other things, financial institutions will be required to ask an applicant to provide demographic information. Um, and that, that includes information about the applicant's principal owners um, or the ownership status. And 
Um, as with mortgage reporting, applicants can choose not to provide an answer. Um, but if the applicant doesn't provide ethnicity, race, or sex information for at least one principal owner, the Bureau is proposing that the institution must collect that information um, for at least one principal owner via visual observation, just, just the race and ethnicity um, and or um, but not, but not sex. They'd have to collect that information if they uh, meet in person or by video with any of the principal owners. Um, you know, to that end, you know, th there was some question about how an institution is supposed to go about asking these questions and making sure that the applicant understands um, the definitions of small business, women-owned and minority-owned business, and the proposal does include a model data collection form that financial institutions could use. And that explains to an applicant the reasons for collecting the information. And it also includes a, a non-discrimination notice. So there's a lot of um, information in the proposal, um, a lot of background uh, for those who are interested. Um, the uh, the proposal is going to require annual reporting, which would generally be due on June 1st of each calendar year, but the small business creditors should have some time to implement these changes because compliance isn't going to be required until approximately 18 months after a final rule is published. Um, so that, that could still be a couple of years from now, potentially. Interested parties have 90 days from the date the proposed rule is published in the Federal Register to submit comments. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Ori to, to wrap this up. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, one final thing uh, before we wrap up, and that is the question on all CFPB watchers' mind, which is what is the status of Rohit Chopra's nomination to be the next CFPB director? Uh, Mr. Chopra had his confirmation hearing months ago. Initial speculation was that he would be confirmed by a closely divided Senate as soon as Lena Khan was confirmed to the FTC to ensure that the Republicans who hold two FTC seats would not have a majority uh, at the FTC. But Ms. Khan was confirmed back in June, and Mr. Chopra's uh, nomination has not moved. The latest speculation is that the vote on Mr. Chopra may be delayed pending the nomination and confirmation of his successor at the FTC to ensure a continued three to two Democratic majority at the commission uh, where Mr. Chopra holds the third Democratic seat. All that said, we do expect Mr. Chopra to be confirmed before the end of the year. That's it for today. Thank you very much to our audience for tuning in. A few brief reminders. You will receive an email with a link to the recording of today's call, and the recording will also be available as a podcast on your preferred podcast platform. Lastly, as mentioned before, if you have any questions related to today's content, please email them to gfm at mayorbrown.com. Thank you again for your participation. You may all now disconnect.